Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. DanielWordsworth.com for any uh, questions or comments you'd like to make on the podcast and follow Daniel on the socials. Daniel Wordsworth, of course. Hello, Daniel. Hi, Fitz. Getting lots of great feedback from your last episode, The CEO Hacks for Life. Great. And in that episode, you, at the start, you teased what we might talk about this time, right. which was uh, the things we think are true but aren't. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which is, uh, I guess, what comes from your experience as a, as a humanitarian, as a, as a CEO, or just as a human being. Where does this come from? I think I'm just doing it to be fun. I like to be a contrarian, but yeah. I think it's come up. Just just observations, really. I don't know where <laughs> they're coming from exactly, but they're fun for me. All right. Well, let, off you go and let me let me quiz you as we get to each one right. where I'll, I'll find any inconsistencies. <laughs> now, and I get it. Uh, some of these listeners may think, no, I never thought that. But, you know, these are sort of things people generally think are true or mm -hmm. suspect they're true, but I think they are. Okay. So first one, there are no dumb ideas. I'm going to say there are plenty of dumb ideas. And we'll yeah. talk about that. Uh, two, you know, when you see or hear complexity, that means the person's smart. But actually I'm going to say, no, it just means they're lazy. Uh, three, confidence is a good sign. And I'm going to say it can be, but it also could mean that you're catastrophically stupid. <laughs> um, four, that procrastination is bad. And I'm going to say, actually, one of the most reliable things I have is my desire to procrastinate. Mm. And fifth, that you can rely on your assumptions, because in my experience, I almost never can. So those are the things. Okay. Do you mind if we just jump in? Please. So on the one about the dumb ideas. Right? Yeah. So this seems like when I say there are no, uh, people say no, and I'm like, no, 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 there's some real dumb ideas. And I think coming through COVID and now that we're all on the interweb, and I think most of us would be like, no, I'm starting to think there probably are some dumb ideas. So I, I think the reason why people don't like it and why you're not normally allowed to say it openly is that it sounds like you're saying that the person is dumb, which is what I'm, I'm not saying that at all. You're like you're implying that that person lacks intelligence or they're stupid. And I'm, not, I'm not meaning that. This is not about the person. It's what I'm talking about is the idea. Uh, so it's not an indictment on them. So I'm talking about this in the realm of ideas. And so how do, how do I define it then? So to me, a dumb idea is simply an idea that's worse than chance. Right? So <laughs> if somebody gives you an idea on something and you go, I think I'd be better off just flipping a coin <laughs> than believing that one, right? Uh, it's, it's worse than chance. Uh, because, and I'll get to this, which is some ideas are wrong. And if the person's got a wrong idea, then you're better off flipping a coin. Is a wrong idea not like a wrong opinion, though? <laughs> like it's really it's in the well, what, what, execution? Uh, no, I'm saying the actual idea itself could be fundamentally wrong and then they may execute it with a lot of confidence and we'll get into that onto the confidence uh, one. Are you game enough to give me an example of a well, bad idea? I don't know that I am. <laughs> Let me think. I, I wasn't going there, but uh, so I ask. So that means, by the way, I can have many dumb ideas. So yeah. then I think about myself: How do I avoid having a dumb idea, or how do I know when I'm likely about to have a dumb idea? Uh, so I have a rule of thumb. Hmm. So I have three questions that I ask myself: Have I studied this? Have I been trained in this? Am I skilled in this? That's question one. Question two, do I have lived experience in this? You know, have I spent years in this? Mm -hmm. Three, do I, am I accountable for it? Do I have skin in the game? Like does it matter with what my idea is? Well, am I going to pay a cost to this idea? But here's my thing. You must have two of three. You must have two of three in order for your idea to be um, better than chance. So it's not enough to just say, I've studied this for years. I mean, all of us have experienced sort of academics that we mm -hmm. know they've never had to live it in the real life. They have no real accountability for results. They're just in an ivory tower. So just having one of those things. Sometimes a person can have lived experience, but they have no zero accountability. They've not really thought about it at any kind of level. And that's where you have temptation for, you know, sort of a victim mindset in that space. And then the third one, do you have skin in the game? Because in the end, it's easy to have ideas and thoughts and tips and advice, 
But if there's no consequence to you, how can you rely on it? You know, life hasn't forced you to, to yeah. be reliable. And so I say you must have – if I am thinking about an issue, I will ask myself, have I been trained in this? Do I have lived experience in this? Am I accountable for this? And if I don't get two out of three, then I know the idea I'm about to say is probably wrong and so I don't say it. Yeah, and so it's no better than flipping a coin. Where's another area where this applies? So there's a real popular concept in all books on innovation and in Silicon Valley, and that's the beginner mind. Yeah. So the idea of this is those that have mastery, we talked about mastery in a previous exercise, yeah. right? So mastery to me is knowing what you're talking about. So that a person who's trained, skilled, experienced, doing it, accountable for it, the idea is that that person is enmeshed in um, – there's a sort of set of unquestioned assumptions that they are stuck in the status quo, they can't see beyond it, and that somehow if you come in with a childlike mind, you can have a breakthrough. Yeah. Now, I just think, first of all, would you go to a hairdresser that way? <laughs> would you go, there's a hairdresser that says, you know what, I'm going to break new ground on hair. I know nothing about cutting hair. I've never done it in my <laughs> life, uh, and I'm going to try it out. No, you would never do that. Would you get on an aeroplane where the person, the pilot <laughs> up the front is like, i got to tell you guys, this is my first flight ever, but I'm approaching this with a beginner mind. If you went into a <laughs> surgery and your brain surgeon said, I was a carpenter yesterday, yeah? So you, this, would you, you're going in law. I'm going, this person might be for a judge. I'm just going to throw some things on the wall, see what sticks. Yeah, no, you wouldn't do those things. All of those things, and you go, well, they're, they're different. And I go, no, I think the beginner thing works, seems to work in Silicon Valley. But actually all those people are coders and what they produce is coding and technology. So they're never beginner minds. They're experts in coding. Mm -hmm. I don't even – would you go to your eight-year-old? I'm having struggled with managing my retirement finances. I want you to come at this with a childlike mind. What would you do? Buy more ice cream. Yep. So <laughs> the thing about all of those things is the result is immediate. Any, any job where you see the result immediately, the childlike mind thing doesn't hold up very well. But it's only when it lasts for years and you don't get to see the result quickly. So that's, But even in Silicon Valley, how many Silicon Valley companies do we know about? It's like six. Now, I, I can see how it would apply in perhaps in a creative endeavor, coming at something with it. Because it, what it does is it removes – the bias that comes from years of doing things the same way and getting results from it. Right? But also a master can do that. As a person who actually knows what they're doing can also sit there and just say, I'm going to think about this in a new and a fresh way. It's, now, by the way, can people that have done things for many years be stuck in the status quo? Of course. They're the definition of people stuck in that. But what I'm saying is with very large, big, complicated problems that to, in order to address and think those things through, you should go after mastery. And you, so as you hear me push this all the way uh, through, it's better for all of us if you know what you're talking about. Yeah, Because if you just come in randomly, you've never trained in it, no experience in it, and have no accountability for it, then I think it is highly like It would be a complete fluke if you were right, which is what, and in likely if you were just in one of those areas, you're wrong. And so you're better off just flipping a coin. Now, I know that's a bit – so am I saying that you should not use the discipline of a childlike mind or a beginner mind? No, but even those people that use that discipline like designers are all skilled designers. But also – but know when and where to apply it. Don't apply it to all aspects. Well, here's another proof point. Everyone listening to this has got some area in their life where there are two out of three. And so think to all the times that you've heard people on the internet talk about your area of two out of three – and how many times have they been right? There are people that I follow on the interweb, uh, Scott Galloway, um, I like Seth Godin, all these people. Yeah. And what I've noticed is every single time they speak about my subject, where I'm a two out of three, mm. they're always wrong. Right. Always wrong. And I really like these people. But the moment they get into my world, I'm like, oh, no, you're right off on that. And I think for most of us that would be our experience. So all I'm asking is that we then extend the, the courtesy, that when we're in somebody else's, when we're talking about vaccinations, we don't know yeah. about them, just extend the courtesy. Yeah. yeah. So that's the one. There are dumb ideas. Give me a second one. Complexity isn't smart. We think that smart people will talk in complex ways, fancy words, big jargon, complicated you know, compound sentences. But actually I'm just arguing that complexity is typically lazy. 
So you imagine you're getting on an aeroplane and uh, there's a Boeing engineer standing there and he says, I'd like to, or she says, I'd like to explain to you how this aeroplane works. You know, it has a, uh, it works with Benelli's theorem on the wing and the shape of the aerofoil. I'm going to explain to you how a jet turbine works. I'm going to explain how the pilot got trained. And instead you'd say, look, I just want to, you know, like you're handing, you're giving me <laughs> the complexity and actually you're freaking me out. As That's you're talking where I was about just reminded this. that you're a pilot. I don't know so much about airplanes. Uh, yeah, I know about Bernoulli's theorem, but you know what's just come up lately? No one actually knows how airplanes fly, which is actually even a scarier thing. Like I got taught it was this Bernoulli's theorem, but people aren't so sure anymore. So, <laughs> so, so people love. So it's like good luck if you're getting what go we know today. is that it flies. Yeah, we have narrowed that. We have like come to that conclusion. Right. So you, we've all seen those powerpoints, you know, with like so many bullets. Yeah. We love we we love all of this stuff. And I think that we think, and I got pulled up once about 20 years ago by somebody and I was trying to talk in the fancy way and the person just said, you're shutting me out, you're excluding me and I think you're doing this on purpose. And then I thought, well, I, I think you will judge me if I'm not being complex or using smart things. And then I realized that actually it's just um, because I wanted to be seen as smart. Yeah. And two, because I I was lazy. Well, the real the real key is to is simplicity and clear communication. Yeah. So and then to come to that, you have to know your subject well enough. You have to have done the intellectual work on it. You need to understand it so comprehensively that you can now explain it to a twelve year old. That's real intelligence. But if you're if you're a scientist and you're in a room full of scientists, you're not going to explain it like it's explaining it to a twelve year old. You're going to change. So you may use jargon in that context, but normally in that in that environment, what you're saying is not excessively complex, right? It's the level. Yeah. So you can be at the level, but often we don't. We're not in that environment. We may be presenting in one area of our business to another area. We may be talking to our, like we're using complex concepts to people that don't fully understand them and excluding them. But we think that's an example of what smartness looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's all about being simplifying. But I then I would also say that the converse also is true. Be careful about thinking that things are just simple. Uh, so I'm not arguing for a shallow view of the world. All of the truly worthwhile things are complex, right? The universe, uh, religion, human consciousness, identity, uh, poverty, relationship, politics. These are all very complex things. And if you look at these issues and think they're simple, it's because you haven't actually thought about them. Yeah, so if you think that there's a simple view on those things, just superficially, you're probably wrong. Um, but if you really understand them, you can explain it in a way that everybody can understand and so I have a rule of thumb around this, which is embrace complexity but find simplicity in that. Do not embrace simplicity and find idiocy instead. Do not embrace simplicity and find idiocy. idiocy. <laughs> Look on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> number uh, three? Yeah, number three. That confidence is a good sign. We think that confidence is a good sign and I'm saying, no, it's not. But I am saying it might be. <laughs> <laughs> so in our lives, we use our level of confidence and other people's level of confidence as a kind of guide to reliability. And what I'm getting at is it doesn't work. And it doesn't work. And what we've learned is there's this thing called Dunnings-Kruger. Yeah. Right? You know that research? In that research, it says that there are two mountains. There's a mountain at the beginning and there's a mountain at the end. And the mountain in the beginning is called the mountain of stupidity. And this is where you have the highest amount of confidence in your opinion mm -hmm. while simultaneously having the lowest knowledge in the field. So that's that first little mountain. So that's where it says, you know, on one of the graphs, it's like level of confidence. Yeah. And on the other is knowing what you're talking about. Yes. And at that bottom level, I don't know what I'm talking about. Huge amount of confidence. Yeah. So what that means is when you are most confident, you are one of two things. Either you are right or you are not just wrong, you're on the mountain of stupidity. You're incompetent. You're completely incompetent and completely wrong. And that's the danger of confidence. You could be either of those two. Mm -hmm. For me, what I do is I assume that I'm wrong maybe 25% of the time. i got to be better like than the third or something, so yeah. maybe 25% <laughs> of the time I'm wrong. And, uh, but here's the real problem with that. Like I know I'm wrong about 25% of the time but here's the problem with, uh, with this confidence is that you think that you're likely to be the wrong 25% when you feel doubtful. So, you know, if you were to make 100 decisions and you, 25 of those you feel doubtful, 
you would think that those are probably the ones that I'm wrong on. But actually, as it turns out, it's not an indicator at all. That in fact, some of the ones that you're most wrong on are the ones that you're most confident in. And, if, and then, so how would I get around that? Because you need confidence. Mm-hmm. You, you got to have in life confidence. And as you a leader, also don't want to walk into a group of people and go, I got no I'm clue. right on this, but I could be wrong. And if you get a better idea, <laughs> then let me know. Actually, I know I do say that. Okay. Th- th- that's, I think, part of how you manage this. So you surround yourself with a team and I will tell people, I will always seem very confident because if I wasn't confident, I wouldn't say it. Like I have to believe what I'm saying and people expect that in a leader. But what I will have around me are another group of two out of threes. So I'll, I'll, if I'm on a particular subject and I weigh up, that's back to that earlier point, do I have two out of those three things? Yeah. If I don't have two out of those three things that I'm confident, I'm wrong. If I have two out of those three and I'm confident, then I also try to surround myself with other people that have two out of three and I listen to them. You know, I get their input. I also, I only enter rooms that have two doors because of this. <laughs> I don't mean it literally, by right. the way. I mean the worst <laughs> thing. What do you do, scope the joint out before you walk yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. <laughs> before I make any decision, like I think about that, I'm about to make a decision, I'm going to leave one room and I'm going to go into the next room. Yeah. I make sure that room, I peek my head in. Does that room have two doors? Because if you go into a room with one door and something goes wrong at that door, you're stuck. Like that's like going all in. Yeah. And there's never a moment in my life, in my work or anywhere where I go all in because I know I'm just a, a strong chance that I'm wrong. And so I always look for a room with two doors, uh, not a room with one door. That's an Amazon teaching. Is that, yeah, yeah. They, so they, I'd stick with that. Yeah. It's a good one. And he, But here's another trick. Ignore everybody else. So only be confident in an area where you have grounds to be confident, where you know what you're talking about, you've got some mastery, uh, you've got some accountability. Surround yourself with other people that are like that, that can give you input and give you feedback and guide you. But then absolutely ignore everybody else because everybody else is just going to try to take you off your path. I used to have an open door policy for like five or six years. It was the worst idea ever because the only people that would come in, I I just realized after a while, they're just the whining and complaining and all this stuff. And the really good people were out just working. I had to go and find them. Mm -hmm. And to get their input. So I had, to, I had to get out and open the door of my office and find the rest of the people in the organization that are actually doing the work, not wait in my office for people that have got a sort of thing that they want to come talk to me about. In the initial stages, though, of if, say, when you entered an organization, having an open door policy is surely good because you get a sense of... Well, no, what type of people come in? What I'm saying is you, if even in the beginning, you should walk around to everybody else's office. Okay. So it's not it's that not, you're not, not, that you're not listening. No, it's not that yeah. you're not listening. It's that you the open door idea is that you're just you're only hearing from a certain type of people. And what I've found is the really competent ones, the really experienced ones, are out working, doing the thing. And you've got to go and find them and ask them. So you want to listen, but you only want to listen to people where the ideas are better than chance. I think, again, the temptation is to think that all ideas are good and we should listen to everybody. And I'm like, no, why would you do that? Because you've, So you've got an example of that when you started at World Vision and you met – well, Tony didn't walk into your office. Could you just – Yeah, you he was up. He was listening to the in podcast thing. explain who Tony is for me. Yes, so Tony Renato is the guy that uh, pioneered or discovered farmer-managed natural regeneration, which is our way of creating turbo forests around the world. So I was listening. I went out and visited a donor and asked him why does he help put the organization – and he said, because of Tony and Tony was sitting in his cube and I went and found him. Yeah. So this is not about not listening, but I would say, don't listen to everybody. And particularly when you've got a new idea and you're being creative, everybody wants to um, strangle that new idea and they don't mean to do it. But again, most new ideas, you've got to have some time like a new child. You've got to let it get on its feet and walk around a little bit. The next thing that I think people think is true that isn't is I think we've been told for a long time, mostly by our parents, that procrastination is bad. <laughs> or is it spouses? Yeah, no, no it's I parents. had this conversation with my 13-year-old regular. Okay. <laughs> so the counter to this is I do have a rule of thumb actually. I, I think about it as the sons of anarchy rule, which is decide now unless you should decide tomorrow. So you decide now unless you should decide tomorrow. 
and you say, well, that's pretty obvious. But actually, I think most people do the opposite of that. They think, no, I'm better off deciding tomorrow unless there's a reason to decide now. But tomorrow has enough worries of its own. I call it the Sons of Anarchy. Have you ever seen that show? Yeah. Sons? It's like they one day everything is bad and then they do certain things and then the next day it just gets a degree much worse <laughs> and then they do a set of things and then the next degree it gets yeah. much worse. And so it's like every day you're solving an avalanche of issues and problems and attacks. And I think life can be like that. So you're better off getting as many things off your plate every single day as you possibly can because tomorrow's going to have a lot of others. So it's better always to keep moving, decide when you can. However, what I have come to trust, and when I talk about procrastination, I not mean that one that's like, I want to go and let's just wait till after lunch or I want to watch a TV show. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sometimes when you're dealing with big and important issues. You will find yourself having a deep stubbornness. Like it's like in, on this issue I'm in molasses and I have no better way of describing it than I'm just deep, deeply stubborn. I won't or can't decide this or I can't or won't do that particular action. And what I've discovered is when you have that deep sense of hesitancy, uh, you should go with it. And I think that's our subconscious talking to it's us. Trust your gut. It's, that's where that's the gut is saying don't do anything. But it doesn't. The gut doesn't say don't do anything. It does say just like this might not be the right thing to don't do. Don't do. Yeah. It, it not even fine. It's just like no, no. Yep. Uh, so you have got to know the difference. So how do you know the difference? I think the difference is that it feels stubborn, but it doesn't feel anxious. So sometimes uh, when we're procrastinating, we have a lot of anxiety. We have fear and other things. That's not what I'm talking about. That stuff's got other things going on. And some procrastination, I think, comes out of trauma response. And if you are, and I'm not talking about that. That stuff's got a fear base to yeah. it. And so if you feel, if you look to your feelings and say, why am I feeling so hesitant about this? And if as you're sort of feeling your feelings, if it feels anxious or scared or something else, that's different. But if you just feel like, I just don't want to do this, then I, I would say go with that. And whenever I've made that decision, the end result has always been a lot better. What I'd say is the last one. I said you can trust your assumptions. So I had a coach by the name of Jacqueline actually. She taught me something really useful and it's been a big, big change for me. And, and that's why I, I wanted to finish up on this one. Yep. Is that I think assumptions are the things we think are most true. Right there, you know, assumptions are the things we often question the least. Yep. And yet I have found more often than not they're wrong. And in fact, when it comes to dealing with people, I have found that my assumptions are normally always wrong. That, that I, uh, in the workplace or even in my personal space, when I think this person is doing this because of X reason, and then typically what we do is we then react to our perception of that. And I've found that this is back to the hack we talked to in the last episode, that the one way you can address that is just to say, hey, uh, I'm assuming that the reason why you said that is because of this. Is that true? Now, whenever I've asked that question, I've never had an instance where the person said that's true. Right. Every time I've actually said, I got a feeling that you're doing this because of this, the person said, oh, I'm horrified. No, I never meant that at all or something else. Never been true. So then I think, well, is there a way, how do I manage that? If we're going through life and so many of our assumptions about life are wrong, how do I manage that? And so this person gave me these three questions that I use and I use them all the time. And I think about them as the meaning questions. Well, I have a person here in the workplace. So I would say I come in and I meet that person in the cafe and as I walk past, I say hi and that person ignores me. Mm -hmm. And then I get my coffee and I come back and then I'm thinking to myself, that person, that, uh, that no respect for me. I've said hello to them 10 different times and they've ignored me every single time I come by and say hello. That person is like this. That, and that fact, that person has no respect for anybody. That person is really difficult. And then, and then that person must be like, you know, when you start creating yeah. this stuff. So then the three meaning questions simply ask three things. They say, what am I making this mean about me? What am I making this mean about them? What am I making this mean about the world? So what am I making this mean about them? So when I walk in and that person ignores me, what am I making this mean about them? That they're disrespectful. They're rude and disrespectful. Yeah. What am I making it mean about me? 
that actually maybe that person's got no confidence in my leadership. Maybe that person thinks someone else should be – so I make this all about me. Yeah, or maybe I've said something to annoy Maybe me. I've said something that's wrong. And then thirdly, what do I make this mean about the world? This is typical for me actually. I find people are ignoring me all the time. This is like my experience. Yeah. And yet if you were to say to that person, I just came by, I said hello, you didn't say anything, you know and I know that person will say I'm I was engrossed in something else. Yeah, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. <laughs> or I've got something else going on. Yeah, now, so there's an, an obvious example but this happens all the time. We're wrapped up in these assumptions about stuff and yet what I've found is if I choose to ask those three questions, when I find myself going down this spiral, I simply choose to ask those three questions and make the answers all positive. So I go, what do I make this mean about that person? I've choose they were probably really engrossed because they're really hardworking people and they were deeply into their work and mm -hmm. probably doing a good job. What am I making it mean about me? Um, that actually they didn't even notice me, that it had nothing to do with me and thirdly, what am I making this mean about the world? The staff here are amazing at World Vision and they're working so hard. And I, I again, when I've applied those three meaning questions that I've typically found that when I ask the person, I was right on those ones that when I put a positive framing on those three mm. meaning questions, they're right more often than they're wrong. But here's the good thing. Even if I'm wrong, my life still got better, right? I didn't go away all like jacked up and mad at somebody for ignoring me. Now, this can work for your own kids. It can work for in so many different areas of your life. But I would just say, if I say the thing that we think most in life is true are the assumptions that we go through life with and what we find more and more as we push on those assumptions is that those are the very areas in our life that are shaky and they're leading to a whole bunch of other things that are. So I get to that with my three questions when I say, what's the assumption we make about the world that there's not enough, that it's scarce? What's the assumption we make about people that given a chance they'll be selfish? And then what's the assumption that we make about our ability to do anything? Well, we're all just powerless. But if you just change it up and think about those things in a more positive way, I think it unlocks a whole bunch of different things. It certainly improves the relationships we're in. Would you, in that situation, yeah. <laughs> maybe also go and seek to understand from them what's going on for them? I, it's much better if you just go up, be direct and be polite and say, hey, what's up? Oh, be, see, last week's episode, yeah, be direct and be, be polite. Be direct and be polite. <laughs> yeah. That's much better. But there's so much going on in the world that often we can't do that. Yeah. So, I mean, in that instance, that's a person I'm walking past, I should do that. But this stuff is going on all the time. It could even be something that our, you know, we're seeing on TV, so we, can, we can't always address it. But that talks back to last week's episode as well, which is the you know, things you're worrying about. So you go into a negative spiral then because you're thinking all those negative thoughts. This person doesn't like me. This person has no respect. This, you know, this happens to me all the time. So that's, you know, I think the two go together. Yeah. Don't worry about it until it's time to worry about it. Yeah, what am I making this mean about my – I watch the news. What am I making this mean about me? I'm absolutely powerless. I'm about to go down the tubes. I'm about to lose my job, the economic mm. – you know, all this stuff. So what am I making about them that actually there's a cabal of people somewhere yeah. trying to drive economic collapse? What am I making it mean about the world that I'm not going to be able to find peace and purpose and that I'm not going to be able to retire at some point and right, we get into all this but stuff? That may be true. <laughs> but, but it's not going to help you in that instance, is it? Well, that gets us back onto the, yeah, don't worry about a thing until the hard time's gone to worry about it. Yeah. Except in the case of retirement. That's something you want to worry about from the age of 20 and you're yeah. going to start putting up some money away. All yeah. right, run me back through that list of things, please. So things we think are true but they're not, right? So uh, and I, in the beginning I used more provocative language so I'm going to sort of tone it down a bit at the end. Like I, I think we think there are no dumb ideas. There are no dumb people but there can be dumb ideas you got to be real careful of those. Two, just because you can speak in a complex way doesn't mean you're smart. And just because somebody speaks in a way that's more complex than you doesn't mean they're smarter than you. It just means they haven't done the work to understand the subject they're on and explain it to you. Three, be careful when you're confident. You should be confident on the things that you have mastery in and that you actually know about. But when you're really confident about something that you're actually clueless about, be careful about that. Four, Procrastination, we've been told for years that it's always bad. But in fact, there's a kind of procrastination, a really deep hesitancy that actually is very reliable and very good. And then fifth, be very careful with your assumptions 
particularly your assumptions of other human beings, because more often than not, you're wrong. And give people the belief and the permission to believe something good about them and make positive assumptions. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. If you're listening to the podcast and you enjoy it, please share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe or follow on Spotify, or Apple, or wherever you get your good podcasts. And of course, follow Daniel on the socials as well. Daniel Wordsworth. Talk to you next step.